Good morning, Dr. Club. Hello, everyone. Hi, Keith. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to learn from you. Excellent. Hi, Julie. Good. You can see me well. You can hear me well. Yep. Both are perfect. OK, great. That's what we want to check. OK, excellent. Then I will see in about 10 minutes. I'll perfect. take a yep. Just go and prepare. OK. Thank you.
Good morning, Glad. How are you this morning? This is Keith. I think he said he was going to step away for a minute to finish preparing. So okay, thank you. It's Julie. And thank you for handling the intro. No Goodbye, problem. Glad. Happy to be like here. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to stress your voice. I don't know if it'll make it through it, but. But thank you to everyone who's logged on early this morning. Um, I'm, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. I'm expecting about 10 more people to log in. But in five minutes, I will get started with some admin announcements. And then once our numbers level off, I will hand the meeting over to our speaker. So stay tuned. We'll be having more info soon.
Morning, Keith. This is Ann. Good morning, Ann. How are you? Welcome. I I'm I'm still waking up. <laughs> I'm sure some of the other people are as well. So when you retire, you don't have to get up at eight o'clock anymore or at seven o'clock or six o'clock. <laughs> oh, I thought everybody just woke up at five o'clock from, you know, you know. Or yeah. three o'clock sometimes. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not one of them. I had to. I had breakfast with friends yesterday. I had to get up at six thirty. Oh my gosh, we're still dark out. Yeah, it's that time of year. Hey, oh. we'll get it back here soon, hopefully. Yeah. Well, good to see you. Yes, we should be starting here any any moment. I think Julie's still waiting on a few people to log in. Looks like they're coming in now. It looks like our numbers are still climbing, so I'm going to uh, rising. So I will give everybody one more minute before I get started with our announcements. So stay tuned. Okay, looks like we've leveled off. So I would like to start by thanking you for making time in your busy schedules to be with us this morning. I know everybody had at least three other places they could be today, some meetings and some desk work. So thank you for setting some time aside to learn and continue to grow your knowledge in the area. I have just a couple quick housekeeping items for us today. And for a change, it's a pretty short list. Our next event is tentatively scheduled for the afternoon of November 16th. Look for an announcement with more information coming soon, but that's the date that we're targeting if you wanna block something off on your calendars, but do it in pencil. Um, in the spirit of keeping things fresh and interesting, our program committee is trying out some new ideas this year. It, this really is your chapter and we want you to feel involved in what happens in to help you want to attend it, these sessions. So please take a moment and provide any of us your feedback. We won't know what worked or if a new idea bombs unless someone tells us. So please self-nominate yourself to be that person because we would love your feedback. Um, Pamela Jones has been making our Isaka Illini Engage site look fantastic. If you haven't seen it lately, head over to engage.isaka.com slash Illini chapter. She's continuing to make updates and I think we're going to have a brand new format before too long. So keep an eye out for more and exciting content changes in the near future. If you are a State Farm associate, check out our new Isaka Illini Viva Engage site to learn more about what our chapter is up to. And if you're not a State Farm associate, it might be a fun idea to start one for your company too. So keep it as an option. But I know that my list of housekeeping items is not what you came here for today. So I will not keep you from the main attraction much longer. Um, just one more note that your CPEs will be in your ISACA uh, account in two to three weeks following this event. 
So um, look for them there. If for some reason they don't show up, you can reach out to anybody on the board and we will help you locate them. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Gleb per Sipersky today. He has been lauded as the office whisperer and the hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb wrote seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He's published over 650 articles in prominent venues, such as the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership was translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. And as you've heard this morning, I can barely get English out. So that's very <laughs> impressive to me. Um, Dr. Glove's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor, professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, where in his free time, he spends abundant quality to, to avoid his personal life turning into, well, a disaster. To help you take advantage of this groundbreaking expertise, well, we've asked him to share with us about how outstanding leaders avoid decisions leading to people disasters via behavioral science, and why do smart leaders ignore serious risks in the post-pandemic world, and what to do about it via behavioral science. So please give a big round of virtual applause to Dr. Glub. We are so excited to have him here with us today. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Dr. Glub. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Julie, and welcome everyone. So let's talk about what you as information security, auditing, and so on, cybersecurity professionals can do to make the best decisions and manage risks effectively. That's what we'll want to focus on. So that's what you can anticipate from the presentation. Now, what I'll be talking about so that you know what to expect, the first part of the presentation will be focusing on the specific errors we tend to make because of how our mind is wired. You might have heard of these errors called cognitive biases. So we'll be talking about how they apply to information security, auditing, cybersecurity, and so on. That's gonna be the first part of the presentation. And then we'll move into specific techniques that you can use to address these problems. So that's what you can expect. That's the shape of the presentation. And without further ado, let's dive in. Now, in making decisions, you probably heard that it's important to be confident. For example, imagine you're driving and you're merging onto a highway. It's important to be confident, not to slow down, but to speed up as you're merging into a highway. Or imagine that you're changing lanes. It's important to not slow down, but to speed up as you're changing lanes. So that confidence is important. So thinking about driving, as an area of decision-making, do you think of yourself as an above average driver or a below average driver? Let's take a poll and see what you feel about your driving skills. Would you say you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers? Please go ahead and vote. About three quarters of us participated. Let's give five more seconds, make sure to participate if you haven't yet. Glenn says need to have a middle option. Well, you're in the top half or in the bottom half. I don't think you're going to be exactly in the middle. <laughs> so let's take a look at the results. So we see that 94% of us are going to be in the top half and 6% of us are going to be in the bottom half. Now, what do you think of those results? How realistic is that? Do you really think that 94% of people on the call, on the video conference meeting are in the top half and 6% are in the bottom? It's probably not that likely. In fact, there was a study asking college students whether they felt that they were in the top half full drivers or in the bottom half full drivers, if they're above average or below average. 
And over 90% of them said that they're above average drivers, even though they have much less experience than you do. So that's a typical tendency of the human mind, unfortunately, to be too confident about our abilities as a driver and our abilities in all other areas. That's called the overconfidence bias, our tendency to be way too confident about all of our decisions. So all of our decisions, we tend to be way too confident about. And as you see, this strikes everyone. So when you're thinking about cybersecurity, when you're thinking about auditing, when you're thinking about managing risks, you tend to fall to this bias. I tend to fall to this bias. And very importantly, the people whose security you protect, the people who you audit, they will tend to fall for this bias. They'll tend to be way too confident, overconfident about their ability to manage their cybersecurity and so on. When people say they're 100% confident, they are actually right only about 80% of the time. And there are studies showing this. But when people say they're confident, 100% confident, they bet the farm, they bet their career, they're only right 80% of the time. No wonder Las Vegas makes so much money. That is a serious problem. It's especially dangerous for people with more experience and more authority. And people with more experience and more authority actually tend to fall for these biases more often. So for example, there was a study of doctors. Doctors with, who were, had significant experience who were over a decade out of medical school versus doctors who were junior doctors just out of medical school. And they compared, they gave them a case to diagnose and to recommend a course of treatment. And the doctors, the senior doctors and the junior doctors got the case and the course of treatment right at about the same rate. It's about the same rate. Now, the senior doctors got it right because of their more experience and know-how. The junior doctors had fresher knowledge because they were just out of medical school. And that's why they got it right at about the same rate. But the senior doctors were much less likely to run additional diagnostic tests. They were much more confident about their answer. And that presents a danger for those with more experience and authority. So the more experience and authority someone has in the field, cybersecurity, auditing, and so on, the more they will tend to be overconfident about their answers, the more it's going, they're going to be more think that their answers are going to be correct. And that's a danger. So that's definitely something to watch out for, according to that study. So thinking about that, I want you to think and write down, jot down where you think the overconfidence bias might be impacting your company, your decision making your staff decision-making, everyone else. So take 30 seconds to write that down. All right, let's go on. Now, all sorts of business-oriented disasters, cybersecurity, information security, auditing, come from bad decisions. We really need to realize that. There was a study of 423 US companies that went that had over 500 million in assets, so pretty sizable companies, that went bankrupt from 81 to 2007. So before the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis. 46% of the failures, according to the research, came purely because of bad strategic decision-making by company leaders. So for example, think about Kodak as an example. Kodak actually invented the digital camera in 1983. So an engineer from Kodak patented the digital camera. In the early 1990s, the Kodak leadership was deciding whether they want to invest more into digital cameras or whether they want to stick with photographic film. Now, photographic film has much higher profit margins, has something like 62 profit margin, which is great. Digital cameras, by contrast, have something like 30% profit margin, so much worse profit margin. 
So Kodak decided, well, you know, certainly digital cameras are becoming more and more popular, but we'll let other people take that market. We'll stick with photographic film. And what they discovered eventually was that there was no reason for digital camera market to slow down. Photographic film became a smaller and smaller market. And they tried to pivot in the early 2000s, but they were already too late. Too much of the market share was taken by their competitors and they went bankrupt. By contrast, consider Fujifilm. So Fujifilm, similar decision-making by the leadership in the early 1990s, similar profit margins and similar line of business, but they decided to treat their photographic film as a cash cow, that business, line of business, and really invest into digital cameras. And they expanded, they seized market share, and they're around right now, $6 billion company doing quite well. So that's the comparison of the difference between the decision-making of Fujifilm, leadership and the Kodak leadership. And that's the kind of strategic decision-making that can make or break a company. And the same thing will happen at the information cybersecurity level, at the auditing level. Strategic decision-making within these fields is incredibly important. So you really wanna be thinking about your strategy, not simply your tactics, not simply your approaches, but what is your strategy? How, how well do you make decisions about your strategy in this field? Unfortunately, very commonly, leaders and professionals of all sorts deny reality. And that denial of reality is a big cause for bad decisions. So a study of 1,087 members of boards of directors who fired their CEOs found that a top reason, top five reason, 23%, were fired for denying negative reality about the company. Not for poor performance, but for denying negative reality about a company. And this would be something like the leadership of Kodak denying the reality about digital films, so the popularity of digital films. So that is an example. Or Toys R Us denying the reality about the popularity of the digital e-commerce and losing out to Amazon and so on. So ignoring negative information about company performance is a big, big problem. And the same applies to ignoring negative information about cybersecurity about, I mean, you've seen so many companies that had phishing attacks and had to deal with this and this didn't have good consequences. And this is just the big, big examples of everything that goes wrong at all levels. I mean, we've seen very bad quality failures, right? And that's a failure of the auditing process. And so auditing failures, and those are just the big headline stories that we see, but of course, Things happen at a much lower level that with regional stories, local stories that get out and many things that don't get out, but still are serious problems. And most decisions, the problem with these poor decisions is that they come from our emotions, how we feel. We really underestimate the role of emotions in our decision-making. So recent studies show that emotions drive the overwhelming majority of our decisions. 80 to 90% of our decisions is driven by emotions when we do what naturally comes to us without using evidence-based strategies. That is a huge issue that causes leaders, professionals of all sorts to make bad decisions using emotions as opposed to logic and reason and the kind of strategies that I'll talk about. Sometimes we might think we're using logic and reason, but we aren't really because we fail to understand what would be actually we fail to understand how our logic and reason is manipulated by our emotions. And so many leaders tend to, and professionals tend to go with their gut. They feel that something is off, that they feel that something is good, whether it's in information, cybersecurity, auditing, and that's what they do. So gurus tell us to go with your gut, trust your intuition, follow your heart. And it feels very comfortable. You know, trusting your gut feels by definition very intuitive, your intuitions, right? It feels good. But unfortunately, it can often lead to disastrous decisions because our gut is actually not evolved for the modern world. It's evolved for the ancestral savannah. And that is key, that our gut responses, our intuitions are not evolved for the modern world. And that's where we get a lot of these dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that come from a combination of our evolutionary background and the structure, the wiring of our brain. A crucial aspect of this wiring of our brain is the fight or flight response. The fight or flight response was life-saving for hunter-gatherers because they faced risks that were immediate, intense in the moment. 
like saber-toothed tigers. You might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response. It was more important for us to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss one saber-toothed tiger. That was great in the savannah, but it's very dangerous in today's world. We face many, many less saber-toothed tigers. Instead, the risks we face are much more long-term, uncertain, like notifications on our smartphone. So imagine if we jump at a hundred shadows or a hundred notifications on our smartphone, we overreact to things. And so that is a huge problem. That is a big, big problem that we overreact to these notifications, this information on smartphones and so on. And we don't respond effectively. We don't catch the difference between the saber tooth tiger, the really big important notification and the many, many small ones. And we get overstressed and we get strung out. And so that's a big, big problem for us. Now, thinking about making decisions. Was there ever a case where you made a bad decision and looking back, you realized you really had the information you needed to make a better decision? Please go ahead and vote. What did that, is that something that ever happened to you? about two thirds participated. Let's give five more seconds. Please go ahead and vote if you have not yet. Okay, so we see that this overwhelmingly happened to over eight out of 10, over four fifths of us had that experience making a bad decision, but looking back, we realized we had the information needed to make a better decision. So that generally, that that is an indication of falling into a cognitive bias. Now, certainly not happened to me. It's an indication of falling into a cognitive bias, where you had the information you needed to make a better decision, but you didn't make a better decision. And that's generally, again, one of these cognitive biases. So now I want you to take 30 seconds and write down where you think that emotional decision-making might be causing some problems for your company, for your decision making yourself, your leadership, your staff, where might it be causing some problems? Please go ahead and write that down. So again, 30 seconds. All right, let's go on. Now, when you saw me, you might have thought that you know it's normal white mainstream American male, but then I started speaking and obviously I have an accent. So a lot of people are get curious about where am I from? That's a question I get asked very often and they'll be happy to share where I'm from. So my dad is from Ukraine, which unfortunately is too famous right now really wish it was less famous when people used to ask me, oh, hey, where's Ukraine? So my mom is from Moldova and Moldova is a tiny country to the southwest of Ukraine. It's like so tiny, it's a small landlocked country between Ukraine and Romania. You need an arrow to point to it in order to just see it over there. So it's a tiny country. So my dad moved to from Ukraine to Moldova where he married my mom and I grew up I was born in Moldova. I grew up mostly in Moldova, traveled to Ukraine occasionally. 
with so some relatives there. I still, have, unfortunately, still have some relatives there in Vinnytsia and in Kiev. So they're definitely not a great situation for them. So that's pretty unfortunate. But anyway, fortunately for me, my parents left that part of the world when I was 10. So 1991, I was born in 81. I left there in 1991 with my family. We traveled to New York City. And so that's where I grew up. That's where home is for me. And New York City is very much of a cultural melting pot. You walk a block, you hear a dozen different accents. Now, my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. And given that I was in such a cultural melting pot, I didn't. I chose not to work on addressing giving up my accent. Right now, I live in Columbus, Ohio. So if I was lived in Columbus, Ohio, or in Illinois, Central Illinois, or something like that, I would probably work on giving up my accent because I wouldn't fit in otherwise. But in New York City, I fit in fine. And so I didn't work on giving up my accent. And unfortunately, later, as I lived outside of New York and moved to North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in order to get my PhD, I learned that, that was quite, kind of a dumb decision because of something that researchers called accent discrimination. So accent discrimination is a false perception of those with foreign accents being less trustworthy. It's a false perception, of course, but that is definitely a perception. There's only one accent to which this doesn't apply, and that's the British accent. They still have a cult cultural imperialism going for them. But generally, for foreign people with foreign accents are perceived as less trustworthy. And that is due to this one of these dynamics that comes from the Savannah environment, the halo effect and the horns effect, the halo effect and the horns effect. In the Savannah environment, it was very important for us to be tribal. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, well, we'd be kicked out of our tribe. If we weren't sufficiently loyal to our tribe, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. And if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, well, they would take us over and we'd die as well. And we are the descendants of those people who didn't die. So that's very important to realize. And the horns effect is one of these components of tribalism. So it's kind of someone has little horns on their head. If you dislike one characteristic of someone, like their accent, their appearance, their cultural background, their religion, their values, their sexuality, all of these other things, you'll tend to dislike their other characteristics. You'll have too negative view of their other characteristics because it will seem like this is a person who is not part of your tribe, who's not a part of your in-group, who's part of your out-group, hostile to you. So this person will seem less trustworthy, dislikable than they actually should. So the horns effect is a really powerful aspect of tribalism. So is the halo effect. It's the converse. If you, it's like someone has a little halo in their head. If you like one characteristic of someone, you'll tend to have too positive view of all of their other characteristics. So too positive view of all of their other characteristics. It's especially dangerous for business relationships. So I've seen there be a lot of tensions between, let's say, cybersecurity and marketing people where cybersecurity wants much more, where they have halo effect toward other cybersecurity folks, marketing folks have halo effect toward other marketing folks, but they have horns effects toward each other. So conflicts, because marketing people tend to not be very careful and considerate about cybersecurity. They tend to be more humanities people than STEM people, less analytical, more creative, and it's cybersecurity is not their forte. And so they tend to really chafe at restrictions over cybersecurity. Or there's been, I've seen serious horns effects between quality control and auditing and operations. Operations, they have halo effect toward other people in operations and quality control slash auditing have halo effect toward other people in quality control and auditing. And then they have horns effects toward each other because obviously operations wants to produce stuff as much as possible and quality wants to make sure it's quality. And so they have horns effects toward each other. So it works inside a company, but it works externally as well when you're thinking about, let's say, hiring people. And so let me share with you an example from that domain.
Now, the context here is that I'm giving a closing keynote for a HR conference in Columbus, Ohio. So Columbus, Ohio, if you know about Columbus, Ohio, it's the home, you'll probably know that it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's our college football team. It's doing pretty well this year. Hopefully we keep it up. We lost to Michigan, unfortunately, last year at the end of the season. So hopefully we beat them this season. And yeah, so let's go Bucks. <laughs> now I'm giving this key closing keynote at the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference for the Columbus, Ohio HR group, SHRM group, it's called HRACO. And there's over a hundred people in the room. And if you know anything about Ohio State football, you know, like I said, our big rival is the University of Michigan Wolverines. And I'm gonna ask them whether they will hire a University of Wolverines fan. So let's see what they say. Will they hire a Wolverines fan? Over a hundred people in the room, closing keynote, diversity, equity, inclusion, conference, HR. So this is like large, prominent HR leaders for companies ranging from nationwide to Battelle and everything in between. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know, go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> So as you saw, that's just a genuine, people's genuine response, people's real response. It just happened to fortunately capture it on camera. And so as you see in that room of over a hundred people, only three people would hire a University of Michigan fan. And then it wasn't just an intuitive response. I gave them a chance to change their mind. I asked them, you know, does it really matter? For, it doesn't matter for their performance as an employee, right? And people weren't willing to change their mind. So really, kind of powerful horns effect toward Michigan fans among HR leaders who came to a diversity, equity, inclusion conference closing keynote. So this is a powerful, powerful, powerful dynamic. The horns effect and the halo effect. And it pervades all sorts of companies, all sorts of teams. Yes, and it's definitely surprising. But yes, you know, if this is what happens with HR leaders, what hope is there for other people who don't know about the halo and horns effect and aren't watching out for it? So now I want you to take 30 seconds and write down where in your teams, your company, your own decision-making might the halo effect and the horns effect be playing out. Please go ahead, take 30 seconds to write this down. And by the way, I hope you are writing all of this down because we will be using it in group discussion later. So please go ahead, go ahead, write that down. All right, let's go on. Now, thinking about decision-making, 
imagine that for lunch, so be having lunch after this, and you open the fridge and you see that you have two ice cream options. One contains 10% fat and the other one is 90% fat free. So 10% fat versus 90% fat free. Which of these sounds more appealing to you? Do you want the one that's 10% fat or the one that's 90% fat free? So again, 10% fat or 90% fat free? Go ahead and please vote. Which of these would you prefer? Most of us voted over 70%. Five more seconds, make your voice heard if you haven't yet. Okay, so we see that over seven tenths of us would prefer the 90% fat free under so three out of 10 would prefer the 10% fat. But of course, as Becky points out in the chat, they are the same. 10% fat means it's 90% fat free, right? 90% fat free means it's 10% fat. But it clearly makes a difference to people. So as she pointed out, one does sound better. And that's very important because it's about the framing effect the way we make our decisions is really strongly influenced by the context in which they're presented. And so that's really important for you to think about as you present information to decision makers, whether it's leaders, whether it's within your own team, to your peers as you're trying to influence them, whether it's to your leaders, your supervisor, your manager, whether it's to the company leadership and so on, how are you presenting information? people from other departments. So what is your framing around how you're presenting information around cybersecurity, around auditing, around information security, all of these sorts of things? How are you presenting this information? Are you presenting it as this is policy and we must follow it? Are you presenting it, hey, here are some methods and behaviors that if you follow them, you'll be better off. And here, you, and here are the reasons why you'll be better off. I know it's annoying to follow these methods and procedures, but you'll really be better off. It's in your best interest to follow this. Or for if you're talking to the leadership, you know, here is why it will be really important for shareholders for you to do this, whatever ask you have, implementing a policy, getting more money for information so for information security or let's say for quality, talking about how there's quite a danger if you let quality standards slip that people will be uh, notice it and be upset and that there will be problems as a result, of course, depending on your field, more or less problems, again, and thinking about what the consequence will be. So think about how you can frame information effectively to various stakeholders to make your message more powerful. So take 30 seconds and think about the framing of your communication, of your engagement with others. Please go ahead. So let's take 30 seconds and write that down.
Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about the next one, the planning fallacy. You've probably heard that failing to plan is planning to fail. This is a common phrase widely used, failing to plan is planning to fail. We tend to assume the future will go according to plan. And that's why that phrase is used. Unfortunately, that phrase is kind of misleading because it implies that if you make a plan, everything will be fine. That's not a great phrase. It's not a great approach. Instead, what I really recommend you think about in the phrase that you use and the phrase that you tell other people is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. This is about the planning fallacy where it is an assumption that the future will go according to plan. And unfortunately, it often does not. And it leads to serious mistakes, miscalculations, and issues. We see this on the smallest scheme and the grandest scheme. I mean, think about, let's say, so I talked about my Ukrainian heritage. Clearly, the war is not going according to Russia's plan. It made a lot of mistakes and miscalculations. That's not going great. And there have been and it goes to at the company level where various cybersecurity policies and information policies, IT policies, auditing policies, quality control often don't go according to plan. And that's a problem because it's people think that, thing, that everything will go according to plan, but there's often a lot of non-compliance, a lot of resistance, and a lot of things that people don't anticipate. We are not sufficiently prepared for various problems and risks, and we underestimate the resources we need of time to convince people to communicate effectively, of money, of course, to implement things, of information about various options that we have, of social capital, again, to convince people, push through things. And the planning fallacy is a pretty, can be a pretty dangerous cognitive bias. So I want you to take 30 seconds and think about where this might be a problem for you, for your company, for your team. Please go ahead and again, write this down. All right, so let's talk about another a new cognitive bias called hyperbolic discounting. Hyperbolic discounting, it's a common, it's a complex name for a common tendency. It's where we discount the future, hyperbolic, so excessively discounting the future. So we perceive the short-term future as more important than the long-term future. And that's a huge problem. So if people are asked, you know, would you like, one dollar now or two dollars in a year or a hundred dollars now or two hundred dollars in a year a lot of people would take the hundred dollars now instead of two hundred dollars in a year but if you think about it that's a hundred percent return rate <laughs> obviously it's better to take two hundred dollars in a year you know unless you're in i don't think anyone on this video conference meeting is cash poor to such an extent that they need a hundred dollars right now desperately so we, but we certainly make that decision. Lots of people make that decision. So we perceive that short-term future as more important than the long-term future. So we underestimate the value of the long-term. We prioritize the short-term to the detriment of long-term. And for example, you've heard the term technical debt, right? 
or companies, I'm sure you're very familiar with the technical debt. M many of you who work in IT and cybersecurity, companies accumulate technical debt and they, they don't really address it. And that's a huge problem for companies. And they underestimate long-term outcomes and impacts of technical debt. And the same thing for quality. Lots of companies cut corners in quality. I mean, look, let's say Boeing with a 737 MAX, 737 MAX, and this was a huge problem for Boeing. And there's lots of these sorts of problems we see and experience. And this is a huge issue I've seen in cybersecurity and auditing. So I want you to take 30 seconds right now and write down where you see you have seen this problem be an issue. Please go ahead and write that down. All right, so this is a good time for a 10 minute break. So let's take a 10 minute break. So it's, we'll be back at 25 minutes. So please go ahead, take a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 25 minutes, so at 9.25. I will see you then.
We'll be starting in a minute. Okay, everyone, it's about time to start up. Hope everyone's back. Let's talk about a next cognitive bias here. If you've heard of any cognitive biases, you've probably heard of this one, the confirmation bias. It tends to be really popular, really prominent, talked about a lot. So we tend to see the world through rose-colored glasses, meaning we look for information that confirms our beliefs and reject information that challenges our beliefs. So that's obviously a serious problem in information cybersecurity, information technology, cybersecurity, auditing, where people look for information that they have great cybersecurity, they don't need to worry about it, don't need to invest in it, don't need to address it, they have great quality, they have great processes, don't need to change anything. And that, of course, is a big, big problem because they don't look for information to disconfirm their beliefs. What you really should be looking for is not information that confirms your beliefs. You need to try to prove yourself wrong. Look for information that disconfirms your beliefs. It's very unintuitive. That's not how we function, unfortunately. So we need to go against our intuitions and this and other cognitive biases. But here, this is a big one. And I want you to take 30 seconds to think about where the confirmation bias might be playing a problematic role in your company, your decision-making, your teams. Go ahead, write that down, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's go on to another video. So your goal here will be to count the bounces of the basketball. So please go ahead, watch this video and count the bounces of the basketball. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> 
Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla. Okay, so. Let's see what people saw. Which of these elements did you notice in the video? None of the above, only the gorilla, the gorilla and the player leaving the game, the gorilla and the curtain changing color, or the gorilla player leaving the game and curtain changing color. Please go ahead and vote. about two th four fifths participated let's give five more seconds please go ahead and share what you saw okay so we see that over a quarter so none of the above and again some people might be familiar with the basketball video, so I don't know. But I do tend to see that people in the soccer chapters, information, cybersecurity, and so on, auditing do tend to have a lower number of people who didn't see anything, even when they're naive to the video, even when they don't know anything about the video. Then the large, the plurality of the people, just about a third, saw only the gorilla. Then something like just under a fifth saw the gorilla and the player leaving the game, and under a fifth saw the gorilla and the curtain changing color. But a tiny fraction, 3%, saw all three elements. So that is important to know. And as we see, very, very few people saw all three elements. And this relates to where our attention is focused. The attentional bias is a critical cognitive bias here. Our minds, we tend to pay attention to what is most emotionally salient in our environment. So for example, we might be counting the passes, we might even not notice the gorilla. We, you saw that over a quarter of the people didn't notice the gorilla. So that's a huge red flag, that not noticing the gorilla, obviously important for cybersecurity auditing. Other people, only noticed the gorilla and didn't see the player leaving the game, didn't see the curtain changing color, which of course would be serious problems because those can be very important to notice if we don't notice people disengaging, our stakeholders disengaging, or if we don't notice the landscape of cybersecurity changing. We tend to pay attention to what is most emotionally salient and that leads us to focus too much on visible threats or opportunities and ignore critical elements of the context. So we miss less visible key threats and opportunities. So please go ahead, take 30 seconds and write down where the attentional bias might be a problem for your organization, for your team, for yourself.
All right, let's go on. So I want to talk about another pair of cognitive biases, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. Optimism bias is kind of like it sounds. It's people who see the grass on the screen on the other side of the hill, people who see the glass as half full, not half empty. And I tend to be quite optimistic myself. This is not, by the way, it's not a binary. This is a spectrum. So this people can be extremely optimistic, strongly optimistic, moderately optimistic. They can be moderately pessimistic, strongly pessimistic, extremely pessimistic. I tend to be strongly optimistic. So that means I'm a person who is quite opportunity oriented. I'm entrepreneurial, I'm creative, but I tend to be too risk blind. So I tend to not notice risks nearly as much as I should. And this is definitely a problem for me. You know, I have 20, I'm the kind of person who has 20 ideas before breakfast and it feels like they're all brilliant. And that's what it feels like to be an optimist. And optimism can be great, but it can be obviously problematic because I tend to make too many mistakes and have too many projects fail. I would not be a good person for cybersecurity or auditing. People in cybersecurity or auditing much more frequently tend to be pessimists. And pessimists have a lot of strengths. They tend to see the glass as half empty, the grass as yellow on the other side of the hill. They are great at managing threats, which is why Isaka chapters, when I do in-person assessments with Isaka chapters, they tend to be largely pessimistic. People who stabilize the situation, people who are improved the situation, but they tend to be too risk averse and not have less innovation. So people, they tend to not wake up in the morning and have 20 ideas before breakfast. So that, uh, the strength of pessimists is managing threats, stabilizing, improving them. But they tend to have, it's really important to have both on your team, two of each on your team, because the optimists give you more creativity, more ideas, and the pessimists improve those ideas, take care of the problems. But very often, that's not how people play together. They have a lot of conflicts, a lot of fighting. So you have pessimists who, per have, well, who perceive optimists as being half-cocked, shooting from the hip, have harebrained ideas, and they feel a lot of anxiety over all the optimist ideas that are being generated. Pes and optimists feel a lot of frustration and resentment over pessimists being Mr. No, Mrs. No, blocking their ideas. They feel frustrated and resentful, whereas pessimists feel anxious and worried. Now, that is not a great way of collaborating. And I've definitely, before I learned I was an optimist, when my wife and I were just getting together in our early in our relationship, she is pretty pessimistic. So she would be strongly pessimistic. So what I would, I remember there was a serious problem where I love surprises. So I kept trying to give her surprises and surprise her. And she really doesn't like surprises. She feels a lot of anxiety about them. And so early in our relationship, I'd give a surprise and she'd be like, oh, don't do that. She wouldn't like it. And intuitively, I didn't realize that it, she didn't like surprises. Intuitively, it felt to me like, oh, I just didn't give her the right thing. I'll find the right thing. And so I had to really learn about her pessimism and what it's like to be her, to be more in a state of anxiety and worry about the world and seeing it as more full of threats with me seeing it much as more much more full of opportunities. The way that we it's much better for teams to collaborate is along and we learn to collaborate. And the way it's much better to, for teams to collaborate is for optimists to generate the ideas and then pessimists to evaluate and improve them. So for example, I have a six people company. Uh, I founded a six people company, which again, speaks to me being an optimist because most companies fail. Half of all companies go bankrupt within the first five years and three quarters go bankrupt within the first 15 years. So it's, you really need to be an optimist to found the company. Again, of course, some pessimists do it, but it's not frequent. And so I have 20 ideas before breakfast. And again, it feels like they're all brilliant. But what I make sure to do, I've learned to my bitter chagrin that they're not all brilliant. So I make sure to give them to a pessimist. And the pessimist who I trust, and uh, they evaluate the ideas. Now imagine if we had so all six people in my company were optimists, and we have 120 different ideas before breakfast. We'd be reinforcing each other's ideas, and we'd be running in 120 different directions. 
and then the company will go bankrupt. That doesn't work well. So I give my 20 brilliant ideas to a pessimist. I make sure to hire pessimists, first of all. It doesn't feel intuitively good to me to work with pessimists. I prefer to work with other optimists who reinforce my ideas, but I know it's much better for me to hire pessimists because, again, if we had other, only optimists, that would be bad. So pessimists, I give them my 20 brilliant ideas, and they say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but you know, maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And then they take these three half they take these three half-baked ideas and then they work on improving them, they finish baking them, and they implement them because that's their strength. So that's the way that optimists and pessimists need to work together. They need to separate the process of idea generation and the optimists need to let go of their ideas. They need to give them to the pessimists for the pessimists to improve and implement effectively. Okay, so now thinking about that, please go ahead and write down where optimism and pessimism might be a challenge for your company, for your team, for yourself. Go ahead, write that down. All right, so let's go on to the next one. The last cognitive bias I want to focus on is called the empathy gap, the empathy gap. Now in the Savannah environment, again, it was important to be hostile to those who don't share our tribal background and supportive of those who do. So the empathy gap has to do with us not realizing that emotions determine the large majority of our decisions and underestimating other people's emotions not valuing the emotions of other people who don't share our perspective, who don't share our values. So we tend to assume that they're more of a rational decision maker, which causes us to fail to predict their decisions and behaviors. And you've seen that, for example, in the return to office debate, where lots of leaders are thinking that, well, people should just return to office, that's the rational thing to do, underestimating how people's values around well-being and not wanting to commute and be stressed out changed. And lots of people, and I've seen this be definitely issues in cybersecurity, auditing information so technology, that this is with the return to office is an issue. But it's also an issue in on where cybersecurity folks underestimate how annoying cybersecurity protocols are to others. And they underestimate how difficult it is to change. The same thing for new quality control processes, new auditing procedures and how much people experience anxiety around being audited, for example. So thinking about the role of emotions is really important and we greatly underestimate the role of emotions in people's decision-making in professional settings. Okay, so given that, please go ahead and write down where the empathy gap might be playing a negative role in your own organization, in your own team, in your own decision-making.
Okay, everyone. Hopefully you've finished this. Good. Now at this stage, what we'll do is I will open up breakout rooms and I will ask you to discuss these cognitive biases and their impacts on your company, your own team, your own decision-making. Which of these resonated most with you? Which of these seem like they might be the most important and impactful for your team, for your company? So please go ahead and share about that with each other and learn from each other and from your from other people's experiences. So what I want you to do is, when we open up those rooms, the first thing I want you to do is select the person who will be reporting out. So after we have these discussions, one person from the room will report out. So you will want to select the reporter, whoever does that. Then we'll have a 10 minute discussion. And each of you takes some time to share about which of these do you think is the most impactful. You can talk about more than one if you have time. You know, but let everyone share about at least one before you talk about others and then have a more broad discussion. So the reporter, you should focus on taking notes so for so that you can give one or two minute description of the conversation, what cognitive biases seem like they were the most impactful for the person in your, for the people in your breakout room. Okay. Are there any questions about what we'll be doing? You can unmute yourself or you can put questions in the chat. If there aren't any questions, I'll open up the rooms and then you just click on join and you'll join those rooms. Okay. First, let me know if you're having technical issues. Eric, let me know if you're having technical issues. Jeff let, me, Jeff, let me know if you're having technical issues. Hey folks, if you let me know if you're having technical issues and need help with rejoining rooms.
as pretty young. Uh, that we're using for the assessment. And uh, if you scroll over in this, there is a column in here for where automated control monitoring Mike, let me know if you're having issues. Hey folks, let me know if you're having issues and need help uh, rejoining the rooms. I think you were in room four. Yeah, room four, we're, uh, we finished. We just came back to the main. Okay, sounds good. Still have a couple of minutes for others.
Okay, looks like everyone is back. Excellent. Great. So let's get to the reporting out. All right. Who was the reporter for the first group? Please go ahead and unmute yourself and share. Uh, that would be me, Stephen. All right, Stephen. Um, we had a small group, but we had a great discussion. And we basically um, concluded that uh, in cybersecurity, most of the biases that we've talked about, we've seen examples of uh, in, in, in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the, the biggest ones um, that, that I've seen uh, overarching were the overconfidence bias. And that kind of leads to the drinking the Kool-Aid that the vendor provides. Oh, yes, if you buy my product, it will solve all your problems and you don't have to worry about anything else. And, and if you have the overconfidence bias and buy into that, you're setting yourself up for all kinds of problems because things do happen and, and, and bad actors get smarter and they start using AI and chat GPT and all these other mm. kinds of things. And uh, pretty soon it becomes a problem. Uh, the other one that uh, my colleague Kent indicated that I thought was was real key is a lot of teams mm -hmm. don't do a good job of mixing that optimism, pessimism uh, philosophies together. So everybody surrounds themselves with people like them. Yeah. And, and that creates uh, opportunities for uh, bad uh, evaluation of, of options, as you indicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's Excellent. kind of the overarching piece of it. So. Okay, great. That's perfect, Stephen. Thank you very much. All right. Perfect. Group two, please go ahead. Yes, John, that was really 10 minutes. <laughs> that's me, Glenn. Okay, please go ahead. So uh, we talked a little bit about halo effect. Uh, one side of it that uh, consultants come into your company and they know everything mm -hmm. and they're smart because oh. we're paying them lots of money. Therefore, whatever mm -hmm. they say is right and they will solve your uh, problems and then they leave and you realize it's a bunch of junk. Yet on the <laughs> flip side, yeah. um, if you don't bring someone in from the outside, oftentimes you use the same people internally that just cut and paste old ideas and those don't work either. So there's mm -hmm. a, a balance there. And then a uh, a bit, a little bit on confirmation bias as the, um, you're looking for X and the gorilla walks through the room. And mm -hmm. an example of that might be uh, current events right now with Israel. They got uh, yeah. very majorly surprised. Definitely. Yep. Yep. Definitely. And of course, you can get majorly surprised with cybersecurity issues or whatever. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that, Glenn. All right. Room three. I am not sure if I was it's, part of the group. No, it's Dale. Dale yeah. Simmons. Oh, we were my originally. bad. <laughs> my bad. No worries. Uh, no worries. Take note of the uh, which group I was in. Um, so uh, I'm confident, but not overconfident, that <laughs> uh, we we had uh, examples that we could have covered in all of these different mm. biases uh, within our experiences at our companies and and even in life. Uh, one of the things we first touched upon was um, the optimism, pessimism biases. Mm -hmm. And um, this isn't something that is consciously planned uh, within our organizations and probably not within most to try to configure teams uh, that have representation of both of these mm -hmm. uh, both pessimists and optimists so that uh, you have a, a more balanced outcome uh, to decision-making within those teams. Uh, I think one of our group pointed out that you're usually, you know, you're looking to bring somebody on the team, you're looking for their skills, you know, what yeah. what can they do uh, skill-wise instead of, you know, these, these types of uh, um, qualities that they have. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, we, we discussed a little bit uh, about the um, uh, confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the, the topics that we discussed. Um, 
and I'm, I'm probably forgetting most of what we talked about, but um, yeah, there was, there was just a lot of uh, concerns, I think about uh, two, uh, whether we uh, end up with a, uh, you know, a tech deficit because of uh, yeah, tech uh, trying to, you know, pursue too much without making sure we've covered all the bases on the things we um, should be covering. And um, so, yeah, there were, there was a lot of uh, different uh, conversations that took place. We touched mm -hmm. on the, uh, some of the other biases as well, but um, yeah, we could see this within our own organizations. Excellent. That's, that's why it's very important. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good. Thank you, Dale. Okay. Group four, please go ahead. All right. Group four. This is Alicia. Mm -hmm. And we talked about a couple of the biases um, and uh, two of those were, you know, framing and also the the emotional, um, mm. you know, the the presence of emotions, right, and the the high mm. percentage of those in in yeah. decision making. That was kind of, um, I don't know, kind of surprising to to see <laughs> that statistic that it's eighty to ninety percent. Um, yeah, know, because we don't feel like that, right? <laughs> but, we don't. Um, so, so what we actually wanted to talk about though was framing, right? So that mm. was kind of our our consensus. So mm. so. I just have kind of a generic um, kind of overarching theme is that we do tend to hear a lot of thou shalts, right? Um, without too mm -hmm. much emphasis on framing up those messages to help the recipients really understand the benefits yeah. of complying with those. And that would be, um, you know, significantly better, I think, and uh, mm -hmm. encourage a lot more buy-in and engagement in adhering to mm -hmm. those. Absolutely. If the recipients really understand, hey, you know, you got to take these extra steps, but here's why, and here's the benefit that mm -hmm. it is going to get for you. Um, another thing um, that was shared was uh, really a story um, that kind of mm -hmm. takes another perspective on framing was okay. um, uh, we, one of our participants had, was involved in a rollout, right, um, of a solution mm -hmm. that took significant uh, effort, but really only affected a small percentage of people um, okay. in that in that presentation of the rollout or the report of that rollout, mm -hmm. there was a highlight on the percentage of people impacted. And so while mm -hmm. the rollout was big deal, it took a significant amount of effort and work and really, really helped the people that it was rolled out to. Okay. Inclusion of that small percentage really tended to reduce the significance uh, of that work in the eyes of you know the audience and so mm -hmm. that could really truly have been framed up better to avoid mm -hmm. um, you know that reduction of importance yep. when that wasn't applicable that's an excellent example alicia thank you all right i appreciate that alicia and let's go on to michael defalco i think group five yeah, so thank you for the uh, mm -hmm. confirmation there, Kristen. I wasn't sure which group we were in. <laughs> so we talked first about the framing effect versus confirmation mm -hmm. bias and how uh, and we see this a lot uh, okay. during what are meetings or presentations in regards to if somebody has an idea, it's something they're very positive about and they're going to frame right. it around the positivity and maybe not look at the whole mm -hmm. picture. And so sure. they're trying to get you to be on, in agreement with them and persuade them mm -hmm. on your thoughts. And, and you need to look overall at the bigger picture. And as you're selling your ideas, you may not be taking into consideration your audience. So that was Absolutely. one thing we were talking about. Then we had a lot of discussion on the pessimist, the pessimist versus the optimist. Um, mm -hmm. I think we agree that in this day and age, we're seeing more pessimists with regards to business areas. So it used to be always mm -hmm. security is one of those areas that's always the showstopper. But then we talked about how now it's, you know, compliance, it's, it's corporate law, right. auditing. Sure. There's bigger, there's more players that play the pessimistic role. But uh, mm -hmm. one point that we said that's, or that was talked about in our group was regarding leadership in some regards are these okay. ones selling ideas and, and they're positive, but maybe not in the weeds and not knowing really mm -hmm. all the ins and outs of what's going on to, to get that accomplished. And somebody had mentioned something about a mediator, you know, would be helpful in being oh, in yeah. the middle ground, an unbiased in, individual that could kind of mm -hmm. help persuade or, or lead that discussion in instances mm -hmm. where there's a disconnect. It's definitely valuable to have a facilitator involved sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Group six. So this is Melanie. I think we Hi, were Melanie. group six. So okay. I hope I'm stepping on someone. 
Um, so we had very similar conversations to group number one. Um, okay. the, three, the three that we focused on were empathy, the halo effect, and then the optimist, pessimist bias. Mm -hmm. So when we first talked about the empathy, one of the things that we talked about was sometimes we get caught up in wanting to be heard so mm. badly that we need to step back and remember um, this was a good this was a good saying that someone brought up seek first to understand then to be yeah. understood um, mm -hmm. so you know sometimes you just cut, get caught up and in, in you so badly want to put your opinion out there and be heard mm. um, sometimes it's you know better to step back and, um, when it comes to sure. the halo effect we tend to have the birds of a feather flock together Optimists, yep, yep. optimists tend to agree with each other. Pessimists sure. tend to agree with each other, um, which makes sense. You know, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned it earlier. It's it's more comfortable. Um, yes. You know, <laughs> and then the optimist, pessimist bias. Um, we had a couple of good examples. Mm. Um, so when our when our leaders are the optimists and we're talking about timelines for a project or complexity, oh, yeah. they get excited and they're like, "Yeah, we can get this done." But the pessimist has to come in and say, hey, wait a second, <laughs> what mm -hmm. about, um, and that gets difficult the the higher up the leadership ladder you go mm. to be that pessimist. You know, mm. more than likely, I probably don't have a problem disagreeing with my manager, but maybe as we go up that ladder, mm. I'm probably it's just harder. going to agree with them. Um, yeah. so that's where that, that's where that is, is difficult. And then also it being is. a pessimist kind of comes with a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and so then, you know, you kind of worry about that. We said, well, maybe we're realists and not yeah. pessimists. <laughs> for sure. um, Realism is, is the cover yeah. word for, uh, for pessimists who want yeah. to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> use that. Um, but also where that comes into play is is you don't necessarily want to entertain the thought of possibly failing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 you know, in a company where um, you're very well established, things are very mature, the mm -hmm. thought of, well, that could never happen to us. Mm -hmm. um, that would never happen in our environment. Sure. <laughs> Run, runs around. Yep. Um, yep. We'll be talking about that in the second half of the presentation. How to deal yeah. with anticipating failure. Yes, it's, it's a big, big problem. sometimes in our roles, where we're the ones mm -hmm. that are trying to bring those to light, we're seen as a deterrent. Mm. You know, like, just, we, we're trying to get this done, just get out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's, so, yep, yeah. people in, you know, who are more pessimistic, especially in quality control, auditing compliance roles, I definitely yep. see that way. Yep. Thank you, Melanie. Yep. Okay. Group seven. All right. My name is uh, Kantaraj Gerda. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, we, we also touched on emotional biasing. Um, okay. More importantly, the biasing towards being in a cybersecurity uh, department. Mm. We are more biased towards male in a way that, uh, you know, everywhere we hear the, the, the mainly the, the male part, right, being part of the attack, you take it, you know, identify mm -hmm. some of the, the uh, the cyber breaches and that kind of a responding act. When you look at mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a manly uh, way of looking at the things. Uh, because of that, I do feel that many a times we are not, uh, we are more towards optimistic, more than the, uh, you know, more uh, not having any of the views from the pessimistic side of it. Mm. Uh, that's where uh, I do feel that having a mix of those would uh, yes. team level, you know, department level in a strategic manner. Uh, mm -hmm. Would really help in there to uh, bridge that gap. Maybe if it is something uh, that we can do. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate the turn, Kantaraj. Thank you. All right. And uh, group eight. This is Julie. I don't think our Hi, group our number was. So I apologize okay. if I'm on somebody's toes. But we spent our time talking about the attentional bias. Okay. We thought that, um, it gets overlooked quite a bit because we're so focused on the new and mm. what's information security right now, the greatest, the newest breach or AWI, <laughs> everybody spends their time on that. And then hypothetically, I'm not saying this happened at the company I worked for, it, but you overlook something as simple as like TikTok not being blocked by the proxy. Oh, yeah. And allowing the little things that could have been easily mm -hmm. repaired 
your low hanging fruit and quick wins just get overlooked because mm -hmm. we're so focused on the big stuff. Yep, that's attentional bias, definitely a good example. Okay, thank you, Julie. And the last group. Hi, this is Becky. I'm speaking Hi. for room nine. Um, so we talked um, about horns and halo, pessimist, optimist, mm. confirmation bias, and attentional bias, but I'm just going to go okay. focus on the horns and halo All right. and the confirmation bias. Um, one of our people said that... Um, He's supervised a bunch of investigators and a mm -hmm. lot of the investigators are looking for things that support their agendas and sure. not um, ignoring, but not seeking out either the stuff that doesn't. So mm -hmm. um, that can cause voice. a real problem. And then <laughs> Renee gave a good example of people that of the horns and halo effect when people who know the boss or manager can get away with a lot of things and mm -hmm so far as even not not accomplishing what they've been hired to do just because they're friends and so the manager or boss or who owner of the company whatever doesn't even mm -hmm. see that this person's not actually doing anything <laughs> yeah, that so. can definitely be a serious problem excellent good examples becky okay perfect now i'll take any questions about the cognitive biases themselves before we move on to solving these problems. So please go ahead, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Happy to take questions about these cognitive biases. I'll ask one. Yeah, go ahead, Kirsten. This is Kirsten. Kirsten, um, yes. <laughs> So I kind of felt like in my position, in my job, I probably have to be kind of more the optimist because I have to mm -hmm. help my teammates kind of work their work towards what the leadership wants, right? So what's their okay. vision? How do we help make sure what the, the team wants also meets to the vision? Mm -hmm. But then I kind of wondered if I'm not maybe more the pessimist in person, right? So home mm -hmm. and work and what and not work, but at home and my personality do you yeah. see that as a possibility that people can Oh, sure. Uh, it's what I tend to see is people, um, they per people perform best when their natural role is inclined with their you know, actual personality. So you have to overcome your intuitions to be in a role and you have to constantly battle those intuitions. So of course, it, it tends to be more the case when you're a manager that you have to do, that you have to have more of that burden because managers whether they're optimists or pessimists, it's often the case that they need to display aspects of both of both modalities. And so managers tend to, let's say someone is just technical specialist, compliance, cybersecurity, whatever, they tend to mostly be pe pessimistic, like I mentioned. But when you get into a manager role, it's part of your job is to cheer people onward and encourage them to complete their projects. And there's more expression of optimism but it's harder to do that for people uh, who are not naturally optimistic they have to work against their intuitions thanks sure kirsten lionel okay. asks uh, hold on for a second lionel asks in the chat is one bias stronger than others across people uh, I would say the strongest ones I tend to see are the confirmation bias and the overconfidence bias. Those tend to be the strongest biases among people. So those would be the ones that I would see as the most powerful and the most widely applicable. Okay. Oh, somebody else had a question, Glenn. Uh, just maybe an observation. Uh, yeah. you're, we're talking about emotions drive 80 to 90% of our decisions versus logic mm -hmm. and reason. And it occurred to me, as that was being stated, our previous ISACA presenter was discussing and talking about AI or mm -hmm. artificial, or IA rather, art, or, uh, yeah, it is AI, artificial AI. intelligence, and saying that it's, uh, he was indicating that it's not going to take over everything for quite some time because it does not have intuition. Hmm. That someone who is a say a human can look at something and say you know what it just doesn't feel right something is wrong it doesn't have intuition 
they haven't figured out how to put that in yet. So I thought that was kind of interesting that um, kind of in conjunction with the thing about emotions and whatnot. Well, so when we think about intuition in people, it's based on two dynamics. One is those inborn instincts, and they sometimes lead us in the right direction when they need we need to get out of the way of a moving bus, but often lead us in the wrong direction when we have the overconfidence bias and all of that. So intuition, like I mentioned, is far from every far from good. Uh, it can be helpful in certain cases that match the savanna, and in others, it doesn't. So there's the inborn instance. Another aspect of intuition is pattern matching. When we've seen a lot of patterns over time, and then we can identify those patterns quickly. So when we think about pattern matching, AI is actually great at pattern matching. Like that's the essence of its function <laughs> is pattern matching, predicting the next word, the next piece of code, whatever it might be, based on previous patterns that it learned about. So it doesn't have those in inborn instincts, but it's actually when you like dig down into what intuition is, those two components, that actually is not a very all that valuable, I'd say. And it actually does have very good pattern matching to such an extent that it's doing better than let's say many radiologists are already at evaluating radiology exam, radiology stuff, because it has better <laughs> pattern matching. So our intuition, I think your previous presenter is just not really thinking about, it's kind of like a hope, not really a reality when you break down what actually intuition is. So that would be my response, Glenn. Other folks, other questions? And by the way, I'm not, uh, if you are interested, I just had a piece published in Fox News on AI, like literally came out today. So this might be an interesting uh, piece for you to read for you, Glenn, everybody else talks about cybersecurity and AI. So I put it in the chat for you to check out. All right, good. So no questions, it looks like. Then let's take a break. It's uh, 10.23 right now. So let's keep, be back at 10.35, everyone. 10.35. See you then.
Okay, everyone, let's give another minute and then we'll start. I see a couple of people read my article, Glenn. Good, I'm glad that you enjoyed the article. And it's definitely disconcerting, I understand. Okay, 30 more seconds and then we'll start. All right, let's restart. So, how can we overcome these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors? Well, like we talked about, you need to really learn to go against your intuitions because our intuitions are going to sometimes be right. They're sometimes going to be wrong, but you always need to check with your head. Our intuitions were great for her helping humans survive in the ancestral savannah, but in today's modern world, they're not really well wired to help us make good decisions. So for example, consider the ancestral savanna. It was very important for us when we came across a source of sugar, like honey, bananas, apples, to eat as much food as possible. That was very important. That's what helped us survive. In the modern world, that's not so great. When we go to the break room and somebody leaves a box of donuts, you know, it's very hard to, can be very hard to resist them. You know, take, go by the box of donuts, take half a donut and kind of feel you don't want to leave another half for somebody else. You take the other half and then take a second donut and a third donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone. Not that it ever happened to me, right? That comes from our evolutionary ancestral backgrounds. And so that is an instinct that a lot of people have worked and learned how to fight. Maybe you pass by those donuts and you go to the bowl of fruit in the break room, which is a much better option and a much healthier option. So you will already probably have a number of strategies to address for your physical fitness, the, your intuitions, whether it's the temptations to eat too much, the temptations to not exercise, you have some strategies. Then you need to think about those and apply them to your mental fitness, how you make decisions. And sometimes you need to really learn to go against those intuitions as Kirsten learned to go against her intuitions and that, that she's naturally pessimistic, but she needs to show some optimism in the when she's helping her team with projects, kind of more in a managerial role. And there are many, many areas where you need to think about overcoming those intuitions, like I talked about with all those cognitive biases and that you talked about in the breakout rooms with all those cognitive biases. So here, what you need to learn and think about are two important elements, emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Emotional intelligence has to do with being aware of and managing your own emotions. And that has to do with you engaging with cognitive biases and preventing yourself from falling into these cognitive biases because our emotions, as we discussed, overwhelmingly determine our decisions. Let me just go ahead and decide how we naturally decide when we go with what feels right to us. You also have to think about social intelligence, which has to do with awareness and management of other people's emotions and their relationships with each other. Because if you do that, that's what will help you make, help other people make good decisions. So that's what's crucial for helping other people make good decisions. So these are two 
that means emotional intelligence and social intelligence where you really need to get good emotional intelligence for your own decisions, social intelligence for helping other people make good decisions. Now let's go on to the SWOT analysis. I always bring this up because that's a technique that many people use suggest to address problems and weaknesses. Unfortunately, it's kind of be a dangerous technique because if you don't account for cognitive biases in the SWOT analysis, it results in a false sense of comfort that undermines decisions and plans. So you probably heard about the SWOT. That's where people look in a team, look at their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's a typical SWOT analysis. But when I look at what people produce, they overwhelmingly don't account for cognitive biases and they seriously overestimate their strengths and opportunities and drastically underestimate weaknesses and threats. So SWOT analysis can be a pretty problematic technique if you don't account for cognitive biases with it. Now, let's talk about a technique that you actually can and should use to address a number of these cognitive biases at once. The assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. So knowledge is power. The first way to address cognitive biases is to know about them. The assessment focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings and helps you evaluate how they impact you, your workplace, their extent in your workplace, and provide you them with the next steps for addressing them. So let's talk about what this assessment involves. And what I'll do is I'll do screen sharing again. So you can take a look at the assessment. This is the assessment and just gives a description and see here the directions. Each question below, so we'll be using chat for this feature, by the way, so be prepared to chat. Each question below refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. And you wanna think about how often it occurred in your workplace over the last year. So whatever workplace you want to apply to, whatever you're most familiar with. The answer for each question will be in percentage terms out of all possible times that the problem might have occurred. Don't overthink it, just go with your initial impressions. It's likely going to be close enough to accurate. So let's take a few look at a few of the questions. Now, in your workplace, what percentage of projects missed a deadline or went over budget over the past year? Please go ahead and type the answer in percentage terms into the chat. 40, 60, 10, 99%. So Anne says 99%. Michael also 100%, Deborah and Melanie say 50%, Jacqueline says 40%, 90%, 25%, 80%, 70%, 75, 70, 60, 60, 50%. Mm -hmm. Others, go ahead, keep sharing. So when we see numbers like this, it's clearly pretty high. And what we tend to see is that five to 10% is normal variance just because of random chance. So it goes into 15, 20, that becomes more of a moderate problem goes much beyond 20, 25, it becomes a serious problem. So this is about the planning fallacy, where we tend to over underestimate the time and the resources needed to complete projects and plan the budgets. All right, let's do number three. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone involved in the decision overconfident about the decision? So at least one person involved in the decision was overconfident. Okay. Dale says 100%, Julie 100%, 100%, 25%, 95%, 50%, 100%, 90%, 75%, 70%, 50 25 So again, the same idea. This is about, so the previous one was about the planning fallacy. This one is about the overconfidence bias. So definitely overconfidence bias we see can be quite problematic. Let's do number four. Of all situations when someone had evidence that would contradict their beliefs or clear information that would disprove their interpretation of the situation, in what percentage of the cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the situation? So at least one person involved in it. 75%, 95%, 100%, 15%, 50%, 60%, 80%, 75%. Mm -hmm. Good. Please go ahead and keep sharing. 45 40%, 85%. So again, this is one is about the confirmation bias. And again, if it's not... 5 to 10% range, not a big deal. 15 to 20 becomes more moderate. 25 and above 
that becomes a serious problem. And so there are 27 more questions like this. As you see from the assessment, you don't need to know anything about cognitive biases in order to answer these questions. You just need to know that what happened, what were the actual behaviors. And so that's the really powerful aspect of the assessment. You don't need to know anything about cognitive biases. It's just about behaviors. So anyone can take it. You can take it, you know about cognitive biases, but others in your teams, you don't need to know anything about cognitive biases to take the assessment. It's going to be helpful to you regardless of whether you know about them or don't know about them. This is a really useful tool for you to use to help your teams make better decisions, learn about cognitive biases, and address these problems going forward. And I'll send you a copy of the assessment after the presentation. Now, thinking about the assessment, How valuable would it be for you and your team to take this assessment and address the cognitive biases it uncovers? Please go ahead and vote. Most people voted. Let's give five more seconds. Assess the assessment. Okay. So we see that it's quite popular. Over half, about half of you would find highly valuable the vast majority of the rest would find moderately valuable. That's great. So it's your opportunity to take it and use it for your team's needs. Great. Okay. Let's go on. So once you identify these problems, how do you actually, what do you do to address these problems? Well, for quick decisions that you want to make sure you don't screw up and you get right, that you minimize the downside. So this is just reducing the risks, making the decision pretty quickly. You can use a technique for five questions to avoid decision disasters. So this is doesn't give you the perfect answer, but it minimizes the downside, which in the large majority of cases, that's what you'll really want to do. Just prevent bad decisions and it doesn't give you the most perfect decision, but it prevents bad decisions. So five questions to avoid decision disasters will really help you do so. Let's talk about what these five questions are. What they are is they're strategically, scientifically research-based to address a lot of these cognitive biases at once. And you can use these questions by yourself. It will just take a couple of minutes once you learn how to do them for you to ask these questions of yourself as part of your process. And you can get your team to ask if you have a decision-making session, you want to make a decision, what you can do is you can have your team go through these five questions, ask and have everyone ideally answer them in advance of the meeting. And then just come to the meeting, be pre being prepared to discuss your answer. So you'll just start by reading the answer to each question, one by one, one of the five questions, one first question, second, everyone reads their answer so that you don't anchor each other and you have a fair representation of opinion. And then you discuss your the and come to consensus on each question. That gets you a much, much more efficient decision-making meeting, and you're much more likely to make a good decision than if you don't use such a technique. So let's talk about the questions themselves. The first is what important information didn't I yet fully consider? We don't fully consider the information that doesn't that goes against our intuitions. So fully considering information, you want to look at information not that confirms your beliefs. A typical way in, in business that it works is people make a business case or investigations investigate things and they want to look for information that confirms their beliefs. You want to instead look for information that disconfirms your beliefs. Try to prove yourself wrong. 
So that's an information we don't fully consider. Also, think about important. Not all information is equally important. You want to decide what information is important, what information is not so important, or moderately important, and decide what information you really want to focus on in making a decision. Otherwise, you might get stuck and fall into analysis paralysis. Second, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? Now, with the assessment, knowing the assessment, you, and having this presentation, but especially once you go through the assessment, you'll learn about these cognitive biases. It has an explanation of each of the questions of the cognitive bias it's related to in the back of the assessment. Third, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do in this situation? What would a fellow member of a soccer league suggest you do? Someone who you trust. Four, how have I addressed the ways this could fail? How have you addressed the ways that this could have problematic consequences for you? We're moving right now from making the right decision into preventing failure. So having addressing all the ways it could fail is a really useful strategy to do so. And finally, five, what new information caused me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about this? So let's say you're making a decision about what software to purchase from a vendor. What important information then I yet fully consider? So you might go to websites that provide reviews, external reviews of third-party software. Instead of just listening to what the vendor tells you, look at reviews, talk to your colleagues, post on LinkedIn, asking what do people think about the software, do a poll. And if somebody doesn't like the software and they vote that it's a bad software, direct message them and ask them why they don't like the software. What dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? So you might be a little bit optimistic about this software. You might be feeling that it's great and that might be a problem. So thinking about that as one of the issues. What would a trusted objective advisor suggest I do? So really look for other people who you trust and look again, the Saka Ilini chapter would be one good example and ask them for their opinions about the software. How have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So if other people need to interact with the software besides you who are not direct buyers of the software. You might actually think about, well, it might fail because they don't use it effectively. So you might engage with them and get their perspective on it. Finally, what new information caused me to revisit this decision? So think about as you're moving through the purchasing process, what new information would cause you to change your mind? We tend to be stuck once we are starting on a purchasing journey and it's can be pretty hard to change our perspective, to change our path. But if you decide in advance that, hey, if a majority, if, if a significant number of stakeholders who would use the software would be dislike it, or I get something like, I see negative, a lot of negative reviews on it online, then that would cause me to revisit my approach to the software. And this can apply to anything. It can apply to making a new hire, anything you want to do. Got it. So I want you to, at this stage, uh, let's do a little poll to see. How valuable you think this technique would be for you. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, fine. Let's see the large majority of people participated. Let's finish up. Okay, so we see that this technique is quite popular. So everybody would find it valuable. 
I like the assessment. Uh, so just under half would find it highly valuable and just over half would find moderately valuable. Excellent, good. So this is an opportunity for you to take this and apply it in your organization and I'll send you a decision aid based on it. But let's talk about the failure proofing technique. So the failure proofing technique, once you make a decision, how do you make sure that you implement the decision effectively? And this has to do with imagining failure. We talked earlier in a discussion about many companies not wanting to imagine failure, but this is very helpful if you're actually going to prevent failure. So this is a technique to help you do so. Gather relevant stakeholders, explain the process, develop next best alternatives, brainstorm reasons for failure, decide on most likely problems, brainstorm how to fix problems, do the same for success, and revise the plan. So we'll go through all each of the steps. This is, these are the eight steps of the failure proofing technique. How do you actually prevent failure for new projects? Like let's say you want to implement a new software or a new policy, or you want to make a new hire. How do you prevent failure? First, gather relevant stakeholders. That's kind of clear, but you want to think about who will be impacted by this, this whatever you're doing. Let's say you want to implement a new software. Make sure it's not only you as a decision maker, but also st other stakeholders who would be impacted by it. So gather leaders who would be making the decision with the most expertise, not just higher up personnel, and include people with the power to implement the decisions, the purchasing decisions in this case. Consider using an independent facilitator for more major decisions. Then explain the process. So explain this technique, which you're learning about now. Describe all the steps so the participants are on the same page. Next. Develop next best alternatives. What are the next best alternatives to making the purchase and implementing this purchase? One best alternative is just to stick with what you have. Another one might be to get another software, whatever it might be. So have each participant write down one next best alternative anonymously. Anonymity is really crucial here because we want to assure that unpopular or politically problematic opinions can be voiced. It might be politically problematic to say that, to say that well, we don't have any better options than just sticking with what we have, or you know, this thing that we're considering is really not a great option and we're considering it only because the CEO is a friend of the vendor or something like that. <laughs> so that is something you want to be able to, for people to voice. So whoever is facilitating it gathers, reads everyone's NBAs, and you hold a vote to select the top two and facilitate a discussion. And then you take an anonymous vote on whether one or two NBAs is preferable to the main option. And you can integrate elements from the NBA in the main option. Next, getting to the meat of it. Brainstorm reasons for failure of the software implementation. Imagine that the decision project or process definitely failed, absolutely. So there's no question that it failed. You know, you're not going to argue against it. The reason it's crucial to imagine that it failed is that otherwise it's really hard for us to actually brainstorm reasons for failure. So you want to open yourself up to this definitive failure. So brainstorm now, brainstorm reasons for why it failed. And each participant, again, anonymously writes out three plausible reasons for failure, three plausible reasons for failure. So the facilitator, you should gather everyone's statements, highlight key themes, and focus on the reasons that would not be typically brought up. Again, things that would be might, might be politically problematic, while, of course, ensuring anonymity. Okay. Now, at this stage, you decide on which of those problems are most likely slash most impactful. Discuss the possible reasons, especially one for failure, especially ones that are politically problematic. Check for potential cognitive biases using the assessment. Then assess the probability of each reason for failure anonymously. Use percentages of possible and pay a special percentage to the ones that are most likely to cause failure, especially the most devastating failures. Finally, brainstorm reasons to ways to fix the problem. So what failures are the most relevant, which would be a combination of the most likely slash the most devastating, the most impactful. Brainstorm ways of solving them. Here's where you get the payoff. Address potential mental blind spots, which are the cognitive biases, ideally using the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace to do so. Next, brainstorm reasons for success. So here you don't want to only address failure, you want to maximize success. And how do you bring it about? Imagine that the decision project or process succeeded spectacularly. 
and brainstorm ways that you can bring about this outcome. You want to write out three plausible reasons for success per person. So the facilitator then gathers everyone's statements, highlights key themes, leading the discussion, check for cognitive biases, and then you brainstorm ways of maximizing each reason for success. Next, you revise the plan. So you have all the information now, revise the plan based on this exercise. If there are significant revisions, you might want to repeat the exercise. Okay. Thinking about this technique, how useful would it be for you to use this technique to prevent project failures? Please go ahead and vote. Most people participated, five more seconds. Go ahead and participate if you haven't yet. Okay, so it seems, a, so about a quarter of you would find highly valuable and the rest would find moderately valuable. Excellent, so go ahead, take it. This technique implemented in your organization, you can you are empowered to do so. That's great. Okay. Now, integrating these techniques into your organization. What you want to do is start by getting buy-in and engaging people's emotions. The assessment is a great way to do so, but it takes some coordinating and takes some getting authority in the organization. So I recommend starting with the five questions that you can do yourself very easily at your own level and encourage others to use this technique. All right, at this stage, we'll go into breakout rooms again. So what I want you to do is discuss the solutions to the problems. So we've talked about the problems. Now I want you to discuss the solutions. And what you'll want to do is think about the solutions, the assessment, the five key questions, and the failure proofing. So think about these solutions. Which one of these resonated most with you? What elements do you think you can bring into your organization to help your organization, your teams, your leaders make better decisions? Are there any questions about what we'll be doing? So again, start by selecting a reporter. So one person to report out from all the rooms. And then remember this time, everyone, what your room is. So that will be helpful. And at this stage, I'm going to, does anyone have any questions? If not, I'll open the rooms. OK, doesn't look like anyone has any questions. Kimberly, Jeff, let me know if you're having any technical difficulties. Okay. Oh. Kimberly, yes. Jeff, let me know if you're having technical difficulties.
Hey folks, let me know if you're having technical challenges. Okay. Anyway, it looks like time is up for everyone. So I'll be finishing up the rooms. Okay, great. Hope you had helpful discussion. So let's start with room one. Who was the reporter for room one? Well, we never really decided on one, so I'm going to yes, start. Go ahead, <laughs> I'm going to start. Um, some others can join in. I, I think um, we talked about a lot of things that, you know, some of these techniques are good, maybe in, you know, uh, going some of these techniques to, to look at a decision before you implement a decision or, mm -hmm. you know, or if you did decide something, something got implemented and then it ended up being bad, then... Um, you know, going back, take a look at it. But I think, you know, even though techniques look great, a couple of things we all kind of mentioned is that it'd be great to have this kind of, there's so much information given, it was kind of hard to digest it all at once. But I think the other thing too, was that sometimes even though these are these especially decision-making, you know, taking a step back and looking at it, um, you know, like the next best solution or whatever, mm -hmm. Those are great ideas, but a lot of times um, one of our participants it works for a government contractor. Government says you're going to do this in this timeline. You don't have the opportunity to actually do that. You know, take, take a step back and 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 try to avoid making bad decisions. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Anne. That was very helpful. Great. Okay, room two. Who was the speaker? Who was the reporter for room two? That would be me, Kirsten. Yes, go ahead. Um, so I think really what we were saying is that um, these are good techniques to use and uh, we probably try to figure out how to use them, but we also <laughs> recognize that we are humans and bias is there. So, um, and we know people sometimes are maybe even kind of blind to their bias. And so how do we use these maybe to not call that out, but yet help <laughs> us to maybe uncover the bias, right? And help us make sure we're stepping back and taking a look at the situation and make sure we understand it correctly. So um, yeah. I think indirectly, we were saying these are good techniques. It might take a little bit of skill to get us there to use them, sure. but we see the need and we understand that we're human. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely human. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. All right, room three. I was the recorder. Go ahead, John. Yeah, um, we started off talking about the five questions mm -hmm. um, and seeing how the first and the last questions, the what important information did I not yet fully consider mm -hmm. and what new information would cause me to revisit the decision kind of go together. Sure. And the thinking about what new information caused me to revisit would helps to feed that first question, what did mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. not consider? Um, and then we talked about uh, you know, those of us in the uh, ISACA community tend to be more pessimistic probably yep. than than others. So that and the whole I think thing with the anonymity in brainstorming can be important to help mm -hmm. overcome that bias and also to overcome authority bias where. Mm -hmm a high level executive might say something and everybody falls in line because they think that's what he or she wants to do rather than doing what's right. That's and, then, point, uh, John. Mm -hmm. and then we tend to make too many decisions socially, trying mm -hmm. to get everybody on board with the decision rather than moving forward and just kind of get stalled in the process. Mm -hmm. And then we also talked about risk aversion, where we don't want to make a decision because of the risk involved with making that decision. Mm -hmm. Kind of the opposite of agile methodology, where you take the risk, fail fast, mm -hmm. and recover, and you know reorient. So, yeah, you wouldn't need agile methodology if we just made the right moves the, using our intuitions. Yeah, definitely the the authority bias is a problem. 
and the related biases group thing where people in a group call us around the opinions of a leader, not simply like one-on-one, -on -one, but on group things. So that also is a problem. Thank you, John. Okay, room four. Yeah, so um, a number of things that have already been stated were some of the things that we were thinking as well and just mm -hmm. recognizing that these kind of two tools are kind of complementary of each other. They yeah. just kind of dive in a little bit deeper, uh, maybe with the um, second one as far as the, um, the fail-proofing technique. Um, one of the things that we did talk about was just they seem like they're logical and make sense to use, mm -hmm. but like anything – how you get those adopted and into a habit and to mm -hmm. your decision making is probably one of the key things. Um, and so building an awareness for folks um, as they are leveraging them to just make sure, that, hey, this is just another tool you can incorporate, but you have to do it on a regular basis to kind of make it a habit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. You, you need to make it habitual. Okay. Thank you. Great. Room five. Room five. This is Jeff. I, yes. uh, you know, all these techniques resonated with us. I think it, mm. in the end, what group three mentioned, I think a lot of that was part of our discussion, overcoming okay. the authority bias. And oh, yeah. from a failure planning standpoint, you know, there's a transparency element to there too. Mm. So like if you, if you don't have the confidence to speak up and address the problems, you could perpetuate the risk that maybe you wouldn't otherwise need to be there. So we thought mm -hmm. that that was a benefit from that as well. Um, yeah. And so I think that was that was the main the main gist we got out of this as far as you know like when I've answered mm -hmm. these questions I pretty much they have all been moderate to me because I recognize mm -hmm. that no one technique can solve everything but the sure. combination of them all with consideration seems to be the the best route taken. Yeah, it's telling you the combination of the questions, not simply one question. Absolutely, yep. and uh, the anonymity really helps with authority bias, by the way. So having the opportunity for anonymity, that is very, very helpful. Keyboard, keyboard muscles, they call that in the social <laughs> uh, yeah world. I know what you're saying, yes. Yep, yep. All right, group six. Thank you. Sure, Jeff, thank you. Hi, this is Melanie Johnston. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just focused on one of the questions because there were so many of them. Um, mm -hmm. So we looked at the first one, the what important information did I not yet fully consider? Okay. Um, and we talked about how we often start with the things that we know and we know really well and we focus yeah. on those because so we don't think about all those things that we didn't consider. Mm -hmm. And that can be really uncomfortable sometimes because it's the stuff that we're not familiar with. <laughs> so um, so we noticed um, that, you know, if we don't engage the right people, we can negatively mm -hmm. impact other people. So we talked about engaging stakeholders yep. to understand how what we're doing will impact them, um, having a gr diverse group of people contributing to the overall decision making um, so that people with um, uh, with a wider audience, we're going to get more experiences to help come mm -hmm. up with the things that we might not have thought of ourselves. Um, and then, you know, finally, we were saying, okay, what's the right balance of gathering information? Um, we don't really want analysis paralysis. You could yeah. get stuck forever saying, okay, well, what are all the things that I haven't thought of? But yeah. we want to make sure that we get the right points, uh, important points um, considered as we're making the decision. Absolutely. That's why it's very helpful to decide what information is important before starting to gather the information to an extent possible. Great. Group seven. Oh, hi, that's me again. It's Becky. Um, so we had a few people that got pulled into work efforts during this portion of the presentation, just mm. to be completely transparent. So we mm. didn't feel like we uh, fully grasped all of the information, but um, we had, mm. and we also had pessimism in a little bit of full effect. Um, we thought that choosing a good moderator facilitator for these efforts could be a really key portion and also okay. somewhat difficult. Mm -hmm. um, because you need somebody that's not going to just be like, oh, this isn't going to work, but also mm -hmm. not somebody that's like, oh, this effort's definitely my baby and it's beautiful <laughs> and you can't convince me otherwise. Yeah. Um, you need someone who focuses on facilitating the conversation, not on weighing in one direction or the other. Yeah, but also not somebody that's just like getting paid to be there. So they mm -hmm. like ha care more about the money than the outcome. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, we, like I said, pessimism and full effects for this group. Um, yeah. And again, we talked a little bit about that hierarchy bias or authority bias, which mm -hmm. that a few other people mentioned. Excellent. But... All right. Thank you, Becky. And the last group, group eight. 
This is Renee Hopkins. I'll go ahead and speak for us. Yeah. Um, we feel that the five questions could be answered internally mm -hmm. um, as far as like having someone be a facilitator for these projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we considered maybe audit could do that. They're supposed to be independent of departments and operations anyway. Yeah. Um, but here again, you got to get senior management or your top level managers to buy in sure. to this facilitator whether it be outside the organization or inside. Yeah. It's important to get and you still could buy have, you know, mm -hmm. bias go on to. Yep. All right. Thank you, Renee. And uh, again, that's like authority bias is definitely a important topic conversation uh, for a number of groups. All right. Any questions on these techniques? All right, so next I'll send you some additional resources. I have a coaching session, three slots open for those first come, first serve. And I'll send a copy of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, as well as assessment and decision aids for the techniques that we discussed. And here is a poll on those who want the post-presentation resources. Again, any last questions? I'll be happy to take questions at this stage. You're welcome, Julie and Ken. Glad to hear Dale and Melanie, that was helpful. Stephen, welcome. Uh, Kent, just vote for yes, and then I'll send you information about signing up for coach. John, you're welcome. Glad it was helpful. Michael and Anne, you're welcome. Becky, glad that the speaking was engaging. Okay, Jacqueline, welcome. Good. It seems that there are no more questions. Doesn't seem like it. Well, no. I would like a second to thank you, Dr. Glove, for sharing okay. so greatly with your time and all of your knowledge today and these free resources. This was a fresh topic for our chapter, and I think mm -hmm. it seems like people were really engaged. So, um, fantastic work with us today and we're very grateful for everything you taught us thank you you're very welcome julie and thank you everyone so glad it was helpful okay well enjoy the rest of your day and uh, i think it's lunchtime so enjoy your lunch for those who are gonna go have some enjoy the fat free ice cream bye-bye thank you <laughs>